So yeah, let's I'm gonna I'm just gonna start the video. And for the first time, because usually what Rebel does is they'll have what is it? It's called like a bumper usually, which is like that little bit before they get into the actual like like it's like a teaser clip that they play at the beginning. This time they, they played the teaser clip, but then Drea started talking and then they did like the rebel logo. So we're gonna get that little like weird switch here and see how she's gonna frame this before we, we get into it. Share it in the Discord though. I can I can in fact do that. That can happen. I hope that helps. All right, so let's let's hear what Dre has to say to introduce us to this uh, fella, this uh, this guy. Is COVID nineteen the most deadliest pandemic this world has ever seen before? You're gonna want to watch this report in full before you answer that question. It's with an accomplished scientist, and it's about his statistical findings on Canada's overall death count, starting as far back as 2010 all the way to 2021. So we, it, she poses the question, are we experiencing a pandemic right now? Or is it all an illusion? <laughs> but is it the most deadliest, Jody? Is it? The most, the, that's the question. Is it the most deadliest thing? Well, I mean, we're going to get into some of the specifics, but I also just find this kind of silly, like, what if it was like second deadliest? Would it would it being the most deadliest really matter? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like maybe we I mean, should. Uh... I, I know what you mean. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was saying page there, yeah, but yeah. you know these people. <laughs> but I also like this is going to be an accomplished an accomplished scientist. I also notice on, on this bumper, she doesn't describe what kind of scientist because, you know, if someone's going to start talking about the science of a pandemic, I, I might ask for a particular type of scientist to do that research. Oh, well, then can I guess what type of scientist they are then? Yeah, go for it. Okay, I'm going to guess. Uh, she said statistics. I'm going to guess. Geography. Uh, incorrect, I think. I think I, I don't know enough about what he does to know if it crossed paths with this, but we're, we're going to find out in a second. So we'll, we'll see how close or not close it is. Dre Humphrey here with Rebel News. And have you ever seen a meme like this on social media before? Oh, this is good. Especially by posters who never seem to question the politically correct narrative on all things COVID 19. So, the meme that she is sharing here, since it's partially cut off for you, is just so you know, legitimate scientists tend to publish their research in academic journals, not on YouTube. So, already the implication that we're getting here is what? we're getting the implication that we're going to be talking about peer-reviewed research, right? Otherwise, why would you share this meme, right? <laughs> right? Because if, if, if you're just sharing it to be like, oh, no, these people come at us with this, it, wouldn't the better response be like, yes, people come at us with this, but guess what? We have a peer-reviewed scientist right here who wrote peer-reviewed work on this topic right here, and we could talk to. As you can tell with my foreshadowing, this is not the case. <laughs> so very interesting that you would throw this meme up right at the front. Just so you know, legitimate scientists tend to publish their research in academic journals, not YouTube. <laughs> Good one. Well, you're about to hear from Dr. Denis Rancourt, who happens to be a scientist that isn't afraid to discuss research findings. That so, no <laughs> notice the bait and switch already. <laughs> well, that's, that's good. That's good, Dre. You're learning. It's like, <laughs> you're learning the rebel ways, I see. They got us with this meme, but like, we're not going to provide you with the rebuttal to the meme. We're just going to provide you a scientist. 
that challenged not just the mainstream media's narrative of COVID, but the whole idea of whether or not it was a pandemic altogether. Now, if that bothers you, don't let your lid pop up just yet. Why don't you hear out his findings first and then decide for yourself what you think about them? Rancourt has been the lead scientist in many large projects, written over 100 papers in peer-reviewed journals, and is an expert in statistical analysis. He looked into whether or not COVID had ever been a pandemic to begin with. His conclusion is a big fat no, it was not. (laughs) And not just... Does he not believe it was a pandemic based on his findings? But he also believes he found significant evidence to indicate that the deaths that we saw from the elderly as well as males was mostly due to how we handled COVID-19 in the first place. Now you're about to hear from... So we got two sort of premises here. The first, so for one, we find out this guy is a physicist or shall I say was a physicist. And we'll get into his whole history about why he's no longer a physicist. But that's what he has his doctorate in, and that's what he was a professor in when he was a professor. But now he, so, you know, physicist, but now he's working on uh, COVID stuff, apparently. And his premise is like, one, this is not a pandemic. And we're going to get into it, but I'll frame it right here because it gets to the second point. The reason why he doesn't think it's a, a pandemic is going to have to do with excess death. So he goes, one, there's no pandemic because there's no excess death. And then two, he's going to say that the, all the deaths that did happen due to COVID were all because of our mismanagement of COVID. But <laughs> doesn't that mean that there were deaths associated with COVID such that we have excess deaths. Right? Like, (laughs) damn it. Which defies his first point, right? So already we got some sort of weird contradiction going on here. Canadian deaths aren't high because we relatively had more sane system compared to the USA. We're we're going to get to it, yeah. I forgot to gird my mind before coming into stream. It was assaulted. (laughs) Hello, no. Oh. Rancourt himself. But first, if you're not familiar with Rebel News, you might not know that we have one of the biggest civil liberties charities ever. We've partnered yeah, with yeah, the yeah. Democracy Fund to create something so beautiful that well, through the fight, the fines.com donations help over 2,000 Canadians fight tyrannical COVID-19 fines. It's hard to operate Rumble, so I don't skip ahead no and like, But now we're on to the biggest fight we've ever done. We are challenging governments over their vaccine passports in Canada. And we're also taking on cases of people who have been impacted by vaccine mandates. We definitely can't fight this fight alone, but we need to fight it because it's the good fight. If you want to help us do so, please donate what you can at fightvaccinepassports.com. Many Canadians appreciate your support. Now, here's what Rancourt had to say. I was a full tenured professor of physics at the University of Ottawa. That was many years ago, but I'm a scientist. I was a lead scientist in many big projects, including environmental science, soil science, space science, meteorites, all kinds of things, chemistry, organic chemistry, measurement methods, measurement theory. I have a lot of expertise. I've written over a hundred papers in peer reviewed scientific journals. Uh, I've been invited to be a keynote speaker at conference at scientific conferences uh, 40 times and so on. You know, I'm, I'm an accomplished scientist and I have the required expertise, both in terms of molecular science, uh, measurement theory, measurement methods. That includes microscopy, spectroscopy, diffraction. I have that expertise at the research level to be able to discuss uh, the issues related to COVID, its spread, Uh, and I've written several papers about it. Uh, And I'm also an expert in statistical analysis. So I know all about error analysis, error propagation, Bayesian inference theory, and so on. So when I read a scientific paper, I can really tell when they're bluffing, when they're stretching the truth, when they're cutting corners and so on. I, I know how to read a scientific paper. I have reviewed, I've been a reviewer for hundreds and hundreds of scientific papers. And um, so that's that's my expertise that's relevant to this interview. Are we convinced? All right. No, <laughs> no, 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 I've, no. He's <laughs> so accomplished though, you heard him. He's done all these things, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think one thing, like the number of papers thing always gets me um, as someone who's gone like in this sort of area, not in physics, but you know, paper writing, authoring papers, whatever. 
like no one, very few people have authored themselves 100 papers. Like usually like, you know, 50% of those, if not more, are co-authored, right? Like you contributed to a project in some way, like maybe you reviewed the manuscript and provided comments that no one listened to. And then your name goes on the paper and you've co-authored that paper. But it's not like you wrote and came up with it, like the whole thing on your own. You know what I mean? Oh, so, like there's such a big paper inflation, especially as you get older. Uh, it's sort of like, okay, a hundred papers, but how many of those are recent? How many of those are like actually good? And how many did you really do start to finish? Well, it's been close to like 15 years since he has been at university. So I don't know how much of these papers that he's given here are ones that he did when he was a physicist at a university and had research grants or was published afterwards, sorry, published in scare quotes, uh, afterwards, uh, after being fired from the university. <laughs> Almost 20 wait, years wait, 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 no, let's go back. What are these scare quotes? What do you mean published scare quotes? Well, so. What are you hiding? Get, so let's get, we'll, we'll, we'll start getting into this. We're, I mean, he's going to bring it up in a bit here anyways, but. This this is what he's sort of like describing as published research. This is the, the oh, article no. specifically that they're going to get into. The title of his document is Analysis of All Cause Mortality by Week in Canada, 2010 to 2021 by Province Age and Sex. There was no COVID-19 pandemic and there was strong evidence of response caused deaths in the most elderly and in young males. It's the title of this article. And it's not in a journal. It's on research great gate and it's got two co-authors and we'll get to the co-authors in a second but i mean that gets to your broader point of like even in the pseudoscience realm <laughs> these people have multiple people working on a paper uh that's kind of amazing honestly but like so i guess my question is because research gate that i it has like weight to it that i feel that if anyone stumbled upon this paper they would think that, well, like, what is it doing in ResearchGate? Yeah, you're back. Okay, sweet. Sorry. So I'm guessing it cut Elron off in the middle of describing what ResearchGate was. <laughs> that is my guess. I know you said that it was like uh, LinkedIn. It was At least I think everyone heard that. And then it, it yeah, might have been out. It's, um... It's the scientist version of LinkedIn. You share, you share, upload papers. You can upload data. You can, I mean, most people don't, but you can upload all things relevant to like projects that you're working on. It's just a decent way to connect. And like, you know, if I publish a paper or if a friend publishes a paper, I can go, hey, can you send me that paper? You can upload private and public copies. It's just one way for us all to keep track of one another. Um, but it's not, it's not like a uh, paper repository, like something like. Uh, bioarchive, which is a white paper depositing archive. Um, white papers being things that scientists have worked on, put a lot of work on, uh, that are officially published or peer reviewed. So nothing on ResearchGate by itself is peer reviewed. You're just uploading uh, pieces that have been reviewed. Correct. And so this this has not been peer reviewed at all. I know that. In fact, it, and we're going to get at the end of this video, we're going to get a bit more uh, on that. But this is something that he claims to have worked on. And, and I will note here, we won't go into too, me, too much detail, but uh, at least Jeremy Mercier, and I'm pretty sure Marine uh, Baudin, or however she wants to pronounce her name, works for Jeremy. They are naturopathic doctors. <laughs> doctors in scare quotes, okay? I don't so know. He wrote this with uh, two naturopaths, or whatever that is worth, uh, which is worth absolutely nothing because natural path. but uh <laughs> but yes so this is what i mean when like i think he's including all this kind of stuff as published work in his list of like i'm published i've published all this work i think he's including this stuff i don't know if you're allowed to do that well he's he's I mean, there's also the weird thing that I told you, like, he's, he was fired from the university, I think, back in 2009, and yet still calls himself a scientist. 
Like, are you even technically allowed to do that? Well, like, I mean, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, like in in a weird way, and I know this doesn't <laughs> fit like what we're doing, but I do think that anyone who like is working in science or like you know doing things related to science, like they're a scientist. I think I think the the bar for calling yourself a scientist is pretty low. Uh, I think the problem is people who do it you know kind of push an agenda like this well yeah and especially it's like there's one thing of like doing work like say you work in like industry or something like this and you do like research for a company or or even if you're someone who like dabbles in uh science promotion or or like because there's there's many people who are popularizers of science that don't necessarily do research anymore but i would still put them like vaguely in the the bracket of scientists right and maybe right. maybe this guy comes close to that but for the fact that he doesn't actually do science he just makes up a whole bunch of shit <laughs> so uh fun <laughs> for your information now if you catch covid and are not vaccinated your health insurance company does not have to pay for your treatment well we well i am at least in canada so that does not apply to us but uh if that is true for Americans, then yeah, get your vaccine. Vaccine? Get your vaccine. Stop uh, stop messing around. Let's see. So I'm guessing that's what he's going to say about publication. But let's let's get into uh, the meat of it. I think he's going he's gonna to start us off here. Well, it sounds very relevant. And in this very interview, relevant. we're going to talk about some of the statistical information you put together in a paper. Uh, so the title is a analysis of all cause mortality by week in Canada between the years of 2010 to 2021 by province, age and sex. And your findings is that you believe that there is no COVID-19 pandemic and that there's also strong evidence of response caused deaths in the most elderly and in young males, yes. right? That's exactly right. Okay, so okay, let's so start with the beginning of that. Sure. Uh, you know, why uh, the years, what was the reason for using years from 2010 to 2021? Right, well, it's important to have a time base. It's important to see the pattern of events over at least a decade. And Stats Canada has put out detailed enough data over that time period. So I would have enjoyed to have that kind of detailed uh, data even, even further back in time. In some countries, you have it all the way back to the Second World War, just after the Second World War. It's really nice in epidemiology to see the path. I just want to pause there and be like, is the speed fine for, for everyone? It's fine for me. I can sort of understand. It's good for me. Good pattern of how a death occurs seasonally and so on in, in the countries that we inhabit. So, so you want to get as much as you can. And that was the, 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 the decade that we had good data for in Canada. All right. And I guess just a quick explanation. We're not done. So that's, uh, I mean, he just explained what he did. I'm going to go into the Stats Canada thing in just one second. But first, I wanted to acknowledge, yeah, I think something weird is going on because I've had to edit the title of our video now several times and it's like uh twitch really does not want me to <laughs> to name it something so unless it like it's switched off when uh i don't know here let me try again and let me give it maybe a less covid deniery title maybe uh covid deniers acting stupid there okay maybe maybe twitch would like that time. i don't know but hopefully this will be the last time i have to edit the the thing no thank you for letting me know it's it's weird uh it's weird that it did that i edited it too so it's not like it's even the command that's overruling you or whatever yeah i don't know twitch is being uh funky right now which is whatever whatever it's gonna do what it does you know so the Stats Canada thing, this this is another thing that I like. So he he claims that he's just using stuff from Stats Canada, which is like partially true, he is. And I was curious, so I went down to, uh, you know, his citations to find the uh, one for Stats Canada. Do-do-do-do. Pull that up. 
And you know, you get this, and it's interesting. So this is weekly death counts by age, group, and sex. And then there's a whole bunch of foot, foot uh, to explain the use of this data. And one of these footnotes is uh, very interesting. So I want to, I can't remember which one it is here. Yeah, some of them are just missing data altogether. Mm -hmm. It says, due to improvements in methodology and timeliness, the duration of data collection has been shortened compared to previous years. Fewer deaths were captured by the time of release. The 2017, 2018, 2019 data are preliminary. So several years in the past are, are preliminary data based on this stuff. It also says these are provisional death counts and may not match counts from other sources, such as media reports or counts from provincial or territorial health departments and other agencies. There are additional delays in receiving the data from the provincial and territorial vital statistics offices. Differences will also occur when different definitions and collection periods are used. Tons of this stuff. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, these are provisional counts and subject to change. Care should be taken when making conclusions from provisional data. As these counts will not include all deaths that occurred during this period, especially the most recent periods. These counts will be revised as more records are received in process. Anyway, so he's using data that explicitly tells you to not draw conclusions from because it's all provisional. <laughs> Sounds like, sounds like a senior scientist to me, yeah. <laughs> and so it's like, his, so right away, you're just like, your entire, your entire, whatever this is, blog post, I guess would be the best way to describe it. Your entire blog post is based on data that you should not use to draw conclusions that you should not draw. So we're off to a great start. 2021 so was that taken into consideration oh, with the oh, fourth yes. wave <laughs> oh of course of course so we we have enough we at the time that we wrote the paper we had enough data in the in the seasonal pattern so you have you always have an upshoot of deaths by time uh in the winter months that's that's when uh, these viral uh, diseases transmit highly and so we we got through the winter period and we could see the deaths climb peak and then come down again so we got down to coming down again and we could see that it was going down back to the summer value. Yeah, so we got far enough into 2021 that we can say intelligent things about that as well. So give us the meat of the findings when it comes to all cause deaths uh, for 2020, 21. Yeah. So I just want to put here too, he's using all cause death. So he's basically going, I'm going to use data that just, I'm going to calculate every single death that occurred in Canada, no matter what the cause, and just see if there's been any difference as uh the years went on right and he's also measuring that like the basic conclusion he's going to go is see if there's a trend line to see like if if the amount of all cause death year by year uh has changed at all that is sort of like how he's going to uh make these conclusions right yeah well you see in in any pandemic or epidemic or just any period where disease occurs it's very difficult with this type of disease to assign the cause of death. It's, it's, it's actually almost impossible with a viral respiratory disease to be sure that the person actually died of that because there's always uh, co-conditions, there's always uh, bacterial infections that occur at the same time, and most often there's more than one virus that's actually infecting you at the same time. It's, it's, it's kind of this crazy theory to think that just one virus is doing all of this. And, and that's what makes it so difficult to assign the cause of death. And epidemiologists know- <laughs> What? <laughs> I mean, uh, th there's like a tiny bit of truth to what he's saying in that, like, yes, there are many things going on uh, in a single sure. person that like, yes, it is hard. I, I find this particularly difficult with uh, cancer. You have a lot of people that end up getting into like uh, getting into woo therapies because they're like, I, I, uh, None of, none of my doctors want to tell me what caused my specific cancer. And part of that is because it's like the doctor's not going to know was like, is your skin cancer due to the fact that you like stood outside of like a radioactive plant? Or is it because you like got too much sun? Or were you like too close to the TV? Or like whatever, whatever it, and ever it could be for your specific skin cancer, right? They won't be able to know what that specific cause is. So like, you could partially say that's that's it. But what's going on with this COVID stuff 
is you have someone intubated because their lungs are filled with fluid and phlegm and they have yeah. covid and then they right. might die of something like you know organ failure due to a lack of oxygen and you might go well, it's probably covid <laughs> yeah no i mean that's, that's the thing didn't didn't people do that with hiv to some extent of like oh it's not 100%. hiv or aids that kills you it's 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 the pneumonia. It's not a real thing because you don't die from it. You die from this other thing. You still have the HIV denialists that exist. Uh, uh, surprisingly enough, uh, the Foo Fighters supported an AIDS denialist. Uh, and, uh, Wait, did a, what? Yeah, and did like a, a promo Yo. concert for them. Yeah. And Why? This, Dave oh, Grohl, why? I don't know. And Dave they, Grohl, of all the people that need to be worried about HIV. They already... You're, you're, <laughs> They erased it from their website. Uh, this was back, oh, this this was like a while ago, but the woman uh, whose cause they promoted, I can't remember her name, but she ended up killing her child because like, she got pregnant with HIV, refused to take the medication while breastfeeding the child, uh, oh, which sad. is, yeah, and the, the child died, and then she eventually died of AIDS as well, all the while denying that it existed. Oh, uh, Dave Grohl, why? <laughs> Aren't you partially to blame for this, man? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's pretty fucking bad. It's actually the doctor that killed the patient by not force feeding horse pants down the oxygen. <laughs> Should be classified as murder. Yeah, Jesus Christ. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, I, I, you, Ezra does this all the time with COVID as well. Like, that's the other part of this too. This, like, this talking point specifically is not one that's like. Uh, different than what Ezra does. Ezra's always, his go-to is this one case where a man uh, Ezra claims died from falling off a ladder. And he's like, oh, he died from falling off the ladder, but he tested positive for COVID. So, like, huh, like obviously he didn't die of right. COVID. That would be fucking silly. Like, clearly, this, they're just overinflating the cases. And it, like, took me two seconds to Google this one case, which was in the UK. And it turns out that what happened was he was already, he was infected with COVID, was experiencing symptoms, but not like severely. And then when he fell off the ladder, like his system was already so deprived of oxygen. And then like it dislodged some phlegm in his thing and it really fucked him up. So like several days after falling off the ladder, he died and he died because of the phlegm in his lungs. Like, <laughs> like the, the falling off the ladder might have exacerbated things or like not helped. But, like, the cause of death was the fact that he had COVID. If he didn't have COVID and he fell off that ladder, he would have been perfectly fine. Or not perfectly fine. He probably would have hurt, like, hell. But, like, he wouldn't have died, right? But they get to go, like, well, he, they're calling this ladder death a COVID death? <laughs> this is so silly. And it's like, just take two seconds to figure this shit out, you know? Like, maybe doctors and people studying this shit know what they're talking about, and you reading, like, a, a Daily Mail article is not a, a, a great way to figure this out. Which was the one main source, I think, that he used, because that was, like, the, the main place that I first found it and had to click away from the Daily Mail article to find the actual evidence. Have you considered the ladder was already covered with phlegm and it got in his lungs as he fell and slipped from the it's all connected, man. It's all connected. But again, it, it, there's also, so he's he's talking, like, so this guy here, Dennis, is talking about this, or Denis, because he's trying, he's, he's justifying why they used the all-cause uh, fatalities for his, like, study. And so he's saying the reason why they went for all-cause is because you cannot determine the specific cause. And the only reason that I think that he wants to do this is because we'll, we'll get into it a bit in the future. But the thing is, many things are going to happen during the pandemic. So, for example, when we implemented certain restrictions, uh, cert like uh, ve vehicle fatalities dropped like a lot because people were not commuting to work anymore. They were working from home, all that fun stuff, right? So it's like, the numbers the numbers are going to fluctuate in weird ways and if you can show that like we had all these other things drop but we had a huge surge in covid fatalities 
then that tells us something. So he already has to frame this as being like, the reason why I went for all causes without distinguishing what caused anyone's particular death is because once you start starting to like weigh these different things, it's going to give you a different outcome than the one that he wants, which is why he's trying to justify this, right? Oh, yes. So they, they, they actually don't try to do this. And the, the, the most robust thing you can do is to look at just deaths as a function of time. So of all causes, whatever the cause is, and that's called all cause mortality. And you do it as a function of time, either by daytime day chunks or weeks or months to get it as a function of time, you get to see when it's changing. So it, it's a, there's a very clear pattern in our uh, northern hemisphere countries around the world. Uh, that you always have m many more deaths in the winter than in the summer. And the reason is now understood to be the transmission of these viral respiratory diseases, because they throw in all those extra infections that then bacteria take advantage of and that you die from if you have comorbidity uh, conditions, you see. So as a result, the patterns are very... I'll just say, I don't know what the fuck he's talking about here. He just seems to be making up some shit. Like getting COVID does not like encourage bacterial growth or whatever the hell he's talking about. I'm not sure. Uh, or if it does... I'm not sure how any of this is like relevant. I guess he's being like, see, it's a seasonal thing. It has nothing. It has nothing to do with COVID being bad. It's a, it's just a seasonal thing. Uh, I think that's like what he's trying to argue. When it's like, I, I think that's what it sounds like. I think part of it too is like the evidence shows like two things. One is like it has something to do with like uh, the air from in winter compared to summer being more transmissible for like an aerosolized uh, virus i think the other thing as well that i think uh gets reported is that like the the reason why winter numbers go up usually and this accounts for like flu numbers as well is that in winter time you rather be indoors and if you're indoors you're in close proximity with other people and that's why disease like viral diseases like this spread in winter where summer People like to be outdoors. They're less likely to be in direct contact uh, with human beings in the same way that you are in winter. And so therefore, uh, it, they don't spread as much. And of course, that depends on the virus. We're talking more about like aerosolized uh, viruses because obviously uh, there still are viruses that spread in warmer climates. regular you always go down to a low level in the, in the summer which we call the summer trough and you go up to a high in the winter months and then come back down to, in the next winter so it's a very seasonal pattern it's now very well understood and the reason that uh, these diseases transmit in the winter is because they transmit through aerosol particles and aerosol particles are only stable in air if the air if the absolute humidity is low so if the air is dry that happens in the winter and we know this because the pattern might is be reversed in the southern this, hemisphere but... So they get more deaths in their winter, which is our summer, and they get this nice regular pattern as well. So the, these phenomena are <laughs> extremely well understood. And um, that's, that's what epidemiologists have been seeing ever since epidemiology was first developed for about a hundred years now. Um, so, that's, so in other words, all cause mortality is the robust data that you want to look at if you really want to understand what's going on. And so we did that and we saw the regular pattern. And we, what we do is we integrate those deaths. That means we add them all up for a whole season or for a whole year. And we can do it for a calendar year, or we can do it for what we call a cycle year, which is to go from one summer trough to the next summer trough. Mm -hmm. So e epidemiologists like to do it that way because then they get a real measure. You know, then they're using a year that, that is uh, adapted to the food. A lot, a lot of people say a real epi or like epidemiologists like to do it this way, right? Uh, nowhere could I find any uh, epidemiology sources like doing similar work uh a lot, like uh there was tons of papers like trying to even like through stats canada which is funny that like stats canada uh has data on excess deaths <laughs> during the pandemic so it's like he went to them for the all uh all mortality statistics but like did not go to them for their e excess death statistics which shows that there are mm -hmm. in fact <laughs> excess deaths in canada weird but part part of the calculation has to do with like you you know what specific certain kinds of deaths are and you know what they were last year and you know like how they've raised and so you you track these sorts of things now if you have a weird year like 2020 was a lot of different deaths are going to be different which means it throws your predictions off so you you make certain like corrections for that and that's how you do the calculation in order to determine 
how many deaths we would predict and what counts as an excess. Which is why, like, I want to point out, we're going to see his graphs, but you could find, uh, this is just a convenient one to pull up. You could find charts of this, like, all over the place showing excess death. So I even have here, we got, uh, you know, this is from The Economist specifically, but it's tracking all, like, these uh, excess deaths, and it explains, like, uh, their methodologies and stuff. But you can tell, like, even here, there's a tiny little graph. Let me see if I can find it. Canada, right here, right? And you can tell with the fluctuation that there are excess days, deaths based on the norm here. And it says 49. So that's 49 excess deaths per 100,000 people compared to previous years. Yeah, but these are from compromised New World Order sources. <laughs> you know what? We'll... I don't know how much I want to give away yet on a, on our journey, but like uh, he might actually think that. I'll just just put it that way. He might actually think that. I mean, he might call them globalists, but uh, same same energy, same vibes, you know. But there's there's ways of measuring this, and whenever you do it, uh, like I was saying here, this is like Stats Canada as well. They they talk about the excess deaths. And they also tell you how to correct for things. So uh, let me see if I can find it. What we've learned so far. Boo, 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 boo. Uh, it says, at the start of June, the number of deaths across Canada have returned to normal levels. However, it is possible that this will change as the pandemic persists. Direct consequences of any rise in COVID-19 deaths may again lead to an increase. On the other hand, the number of deaths could continue to decline. The first wave of the virus disproportionately affected vulnerable populations, some of whom were likely at high risk of dying in the subsequent months, regardless of a pandemic. So, like, that's the other thing is a lot of these people died uh, who were, like, 90, who died of the pandemic, probably were, like, in the statistics, likely going to die anyways. So, like, those, like, even out in, like, the death calculation, if that makes sense, is a little bit morbid to think of it that way, but, like, based on the averages you would expect a 90 year old to die the next year and so if they died of the pandemic or if they died of anything else you would expect them furthermore the indirect consequences of them of the pandemic may still have an impact in the months and years ahead for example it will be difficult to determine the extent of which future mortality could be affected by the impacts of the, the pandemic on mental health they even had a, a section in here as well that was like uh, talking about like car accidents and car fatalities. But you can see here, so based on all their statistical modeling, this one is just Quebec specifically. You can see that uh, there's a range here in expected death, which is like the shaded blue color here. And uh, then the expectation due to COVID and I think uh, what what they think actually, how many people actually did die. And as you can tell, there's a huge spike in deaths in Quebec showing that they're excess deaths compared to the norm due to the pandemic, specifically around April to July of uh, 2020. So uh, there you have it. Excess deaths exist. What are you going to do? Are you one of those authoritarians who mandates and ID checks? Uh, yes. If you want to drink alcohol at my facility, I'm going to check your ID. Oh, yeah. That's right. No alcohol unless you show your ID. Yeah. <laughs> Not serving any under... You know, funny story about that. I was at the... Is it the alcohol store, the liquor store, whatever the adult thing to call it is. And there were two people there that I'm like, you are not... You are not 21. You you should not be here. I know I know you got a fake ID. This is this is our shit. Go home. Go home. Do something else. That's it. But yeah, no. Uh ID checks for everyone. I just I I I usually have a policy of not humoring people in the chat, but I'm gonna give this one go. Why are checks for a driver's license to make sure that you're of age before you go into a bar. Why is that okay? And why is making sure that you have a vaccine before you can enter a facility so that you're not spreading disease? Why is that like beyond the pale? Even though I will tell you, we already had that for like years in school, vaccine mandates have existed for forever. 
yeah, I, I don't know how you could have gone to school and not known about that. Yeah. We all had to send in our MMR reports, guys. This isn't new. But I this is this is normal. But I have a uh, philosophical degree where I discuss these kinds of nuances. So I am curious in terms of ethics, why is the one not invasive and perfectly legal and done often and no one complains about it, except if you're a 18 year old who really wants to go drink at a bar. Yet it's somehow all of a sudden completely uh, tyrannical and the end of democracy when we do it for vaccine. Because You're asking alcohol, me or chat? Chat. So, okay. So, we got an answer. Because alcohol is something you do for fun. How long until you need a COVID passport to go to a grocery store? Well, you come and you talk to me when that happens. And until that happens, go get your vaccine and shut the fuck up. All right? Because they're not going to do it to grocery stores because this is not about tyranny. It's not about depriving people of food. It's about preventing the spread of a deadly disease that's killing people. Okay. So, uh, what if, is... <laughs> okay, not not to ruin your argument, but like, what if we did though? What if we were like, no more food for people that don't get vaccinated? I would not do that. I'm not. I'm not going to judge you for having <laughs> the feelings you do, <laughs> but I get it. I get it. You, yeah, I mean, like, I'm not saying we should. I'm just saying, what if? That's all. Uh, and this vaccine isn't tradition vaccine. It's just, oh my god. Yeah, okay, ban, ban them both. Ban them both. Yeah, let's go. It's not the traditional vaccine. <laughs> it's using Joe Biden. It's using Joe Biden's stem cells. <laughs> oh, and, and I just, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll throw it out there. The mRNA technology is not technically new. It's been around for a long time. Also, here's the thing. Mm. Millions of people have now received it, okay? Oh, and, okay. and as far it's as... Not, am, I, how, am I dead? Am I, <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure I'm still here and alive, okay? I've received oh, two Jody, of the mRNA. Jody, no. This, this new vaccine isn't good for you. It has MSG in it. You can't have it. <laughs> and if you don't want oh, the mRNA, then just go for Johnson & Johnson. Although, like, yeah, okay. It's, it's, uh, it's not mRNA, but it's still actually technically new. If, if you understand how any vaccines are made, which you clearly just get your information off the fucking conspiracy website. So, uh, have fun. Enjoy your disease. Have a good time. Because those vaccines weren't made by Bill Gates. I just, I, like, I want a real answer. I love, like, he's like, this is, like, tyrannical. How dare you want to mandate this? And then I was like, well, what's the difference? And he's like, well, one's for fun. And I'm like, what, is eating at a restaurant not for fun? You could just go to the grocery store and cook it yourself, but you want to go to the restaurant. Then show your papers. Like, <laughs> I see, I see, I see. You want me to show my papers. Next, I'm going to have to show my papers to purchase a car or show my papers to go to a fucking foreign country that I don't live at. When does What's it end? Like, what about all the people who are like completely okay with having their genitals felt up while getting on an airplane? <laughs> Yeah, that's 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 what, well. To be fair, I don't I don't actually think anyone's okay with that. I think we've all just decided we don't want the terrorists to win. Well, you yeah, but so like you're willing to get rid of your freedoms there, but like what? Since what's this what's is America. Likely, this doesn't have to make sense. An airplane or you spreading a disease that's killed way more people than any fucking terrorist. Listen, listen. You have to understand the American <laughs> psychology, okay? We 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 played a lot of Call of Duty. We we're much we played much less. Uh, you know, read a fucking textbook. We're, we're biased. We're biased towards the terrorist thing. <laughs> How come stores are always telling me to show my papers, but never ask me to show my channels? <laughs> you know what? That's right. Next time I I go to the convenience store, I want the the clerk to. Make sure that I'm I'm safe by by me exposing my genitals. I'm glad this person is not considering the workers that they are forcing possible exposure to the virus upon. It's always about their liberty in a consumerist sense. Never true freedom, not being exposed to a highly infectious and possibly deadly disease. You are very right, Mom, and thank you for bringing up that angle. I rarely the reason why I usually don't bring up that angle, even though that is the morally correct angle, Mom, is because that would not appeal to these selfish motherfuckers. <laughs> 
they they clearly don't care about general well-being anyways uh you know so it's like that's never going to appeal to them and and usually it's like the weird puritanical shit with them so they're like of course they're like well kids can't like drink alcohol so therefore like morality and blah but like when it comes to the spread of an infectious disease they're like no let it spread let it spreading kill people anyways back to denis we're gonna get his graph we're gonna get his his showing that there are no excess mortality because all cases of mortality show no increase or something here we go phenomenon if you like right. so no matter how you do it when you do it by year like that what we find for canada is that there's absolutely no anomaly, none mm -hmm. whatsoever. Now, this is very significant because yeah. ever since the concept of the pandemic has been put forward in the scientific literature, it was accepted that a pandemic what meant that you would have many more deaths than what you typically get from get that, usual please. epidemics of viral respiratory diseases. There was going right. to be as many as 50 times more deaths is what was predicted and always said about pandemics. Mm -hmm. And the other feature of pandemics is that they occur everywhere. That it's not just a local epidemic in one care home or in one province right. or one county. It's everywhere. It, it, it goes around the world and it's on several continents typically. Okay. So if, if it was a pandemic, we have to see two things, more deaths mm -hmm. and it's happening everywhere. It's spreading very easily because it's in, it, uh, pandemics are said to be new viruses. So they spread easily because we have no immunity to them. So listen to what he just said. This is him describing what he thinks a pandemic is. And this is in his fucking paper, okay? So it goes, a viral uh, respiratory disease pandemic has two defining characteristics. It occurs everywhere, and then listed as occurring everywhere, it says irrespective of state or jurisdictional boundary. What the fuck does ah. that even mean? Well, Jody, you have to ask yourself, why aren't the libs getting as sick? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Can't be in pandemic then, can it? Well, what he's Which is such a fucking gotcha. It's just such like a stupid fucking gotcha, isn't it? It's like, oh, you were taking care of yourself. Hmm. Guess that means it's not a pandemic if you're not sick. Hmm. Fuck but the, off. But this is how he's going to frame it. He's going to be like, look, the pandemic affected Quebec different than it affected Ontario, and it affected Canada different than it affected America, right? And so it's it's different jurisdictionally. Therefore, it's not a real pandemic. And my immediate response to that is like, what if you just like completely shut down a country and therefore the pandemic just like physically is incapable of entering your country because you prevented all like access to your country. In that case, like, it, you know, it's not occurring everywhere because of something that happened jurisdictionally. But like, is it now therefore not a pandemic? Like no one defines pandemic this way. <laughs> You know, that's not what a pandemic is. And then I love that part of his definition here. So it goes, it, it occurs everywhere, irrespective of state or jurisdictional boundaries. And then it goes, presumably because there was no prior immunity. Why? Usually when you give a definition, you don't add caveats. To the... <laughs> or like... Usually not. Usually not. <laughs> You know, uh, it does this and it does this, and we think it th because of this thing. It's like now you're like adding arguments to your fucking definition. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Mizumi. We just we just had a bunch of uh, COVID deniers, so they they, Vienna was probably uh, uh, on on alert on alert. Uh, but we love you. Maybe we want Nicki Minaj's cousin from Trinidad to explain himself. So maybe do send them our way, you know? Maybe we're not. And then we get the second tier of his, his definition, because there's it's a two, it's a two-tier definition, okay? And then it's also it causes excess mortality far greater than that due to non-pandemic. This also is a really terrible definition. Because I want to know of what is far greater. Like, usually, if you want a very specific definition, you don't use really vague terms like far greater here. How does that help us determine what a pandemic is or is not? When does something constitute being far greater than other things? Okay? 
I also have to say the notion of excess mortality in the definition of a pandemic is also really silly, considering that uh, all the things that we said, that when you start to do things to affect the pandemic, it might lower deaths in other areas. So overall, you might have less death and still be in a pandemic. I also love that you could just go to like, I don't know, Wikipedia and find a definition, which is uh, a pandemic is an epidemic of an infectious disease that has spread across a large region, for instance, multiple continents, continents or worldwide, affecting a substantial number of individuals. A widespread endemic disease with a stable number of infected individuals is not a pandemic. Widespread endemic diseases with a stable number of infected individuals, such as a recurrence of seasonal influenza. So it might become the case that eventually COVID will no longer be a pandemic and will simply be endemic to uh, where we are now. We might be living with COVID for the rest of our lives, and therefore it becomes endemic. But these past few years, it has definitely been a pandemic because it has started to infect many, a substantial number of individuals worldwide. Pretty sure endemic is a certain thing endemic like flu but right that's what i'm saying like it's it's likely that uh covid might become endemic can't wait for stephen colbert to make a super vax parody song of super bass jesus just reminded me that tucker never found the cousin's friend <laughs> yeah i forgot about that it can spread before immune response kicks in so it'll never go away i, I mean here's the thing is it's hard to tell uh some pandemics have have dissipated and disappeared they've just gone away uh having to do with how the virus mutates and whatnot so like that may never happen maybe it will happen maybe we'll get lucky i don't know it's it's not i don't think luck is on our side right now but uh who knows? either way his definition is stupid regardless of, of how you cut it right and you can tell it's perfectly designed to like fit it's like it's like he got the, the all-cause data to show that there was no increase in death, and therefore was like, how do I craft a definition that will therefore suggest that my data shows that we're not actually technically, definitionally in a pandemic? The other thing that's really sort of stupid about this is I almost don't care whether we're in a pandemic or not. Like, let's say we call it a, a, a blandemic. Or a prandemic, a flandemic. I don't really give a shit. <laughs> it doesn't change the facts on the ground. Shit's still happening. COVID's still real. People are still dying. Whether we call it a pandemic or not is kind of stupid. And I don't. Yeah, you gotta win on that technicality, though, don't you? <laughs> Clamdemic. Clamdemic would be fun. Good example of endemic disease is the bubonic plague in California. It's present in wild animals, and occasionally there are humans who get it. Indeed. Indeed. Apparently, Norway has changed their health policy to COVID-19 being an endemic infection already. So there you go. There you go. You didn't even need to do this research paper, bro. <laughs> Norway already did it. Oh, my God. Plandemic. With this guy, maybe. When know. you look at Canada, you find the opposite. First, at the first level of interpretation, you find there are not more deaths. It's completely regular. It's exactly on the line of the trend over the decade. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a graph yeah. in our paper that shows this. Exactly on the line. There isn't even a blip. There's no statistical anomaly whatsoever in the total deaths, either per year or per cycle year for Canada. So, so that's a biggie right there. I don't, like, I'm not a data scientist, but it's like, yeah, look, it, it's slowly going up. What? Yeah. <laughs> That's a trend line. Okay. Very good. But like, I don't know. Like, even reading his data, the, the, I'm get like this is around 2020 here, I think. So it's like, is this anomalous or not? I like, I'm not the one doing the statistical like stuff. And look at like, there's an extra additional spike here, so maybe it is anomalous. It's a little wider. Like, I don't know, to me, these two clumps here look slightly different than the rest of them. I don't know. This guy must be great at stocks. <laughs> oh, 
Okay. Yeah, that's huge. Now, what would you say to the people who say, well, that's because, you know, we did lockdowns, we did social distancing, we did masks, um, you know, all of those measures and that's the reason you're not seeing those things. This, this is what amazed me about this. And partly why I wanted to show this was Drea Humphreys comes in with like a legitimate question. And that fascinates me. (laughs) Right. She asked a relevant question. What about all the other things that we did to prevent the spread of this thing? Does that not factor into your thing? And nope. now we're going to get a really great response to this. Right. Well, um, there, there's, there's several parts to the complete answer to that question. But first of all, I would say this. I would say, are you telling me that there was this extremely virulent pathogen and that you put some masks on, you told people to stay two meters apart, you did all these things, you locked people down, and as a result, we came back to exactly the same mortality that we would have had if we didn't have a pandemic. Not less, not more, but exactly on the line of the trend, Mm -hmm. okay? Are you telling me? That's an incredible fluke, right? Uh, uh, Is that what you're telling me? I just wanna be clear, you know, that's what I would say to them. Mm -hmm. Um, And in science, we have a principle that's called Occam's razor. And the principle goes like this. If you have two theories that explain the same data, then the simpler theory is the better one. All right. Well, my theory is that you're full of fucking shit. Uh, You have no clue what you're fucking talking about. You've looked at all cause mortality because you want to average over the fact that there are more COVID deaths than there were (laughs) ever before and less deaths than the other fucking things because more people are dying of COVID and because we've used masks and other social distancing measures. That's what I think. I think you're being fucking stupid. I think you should knock the fuck off. There's my razor for you. I, this, like, for one, for one, as, as a philosopher with a relevant degree, if we're going to start getting into old school uh, the philosophy of science shit here, that isn't what Occam's razor is. I mean, a lot of people get it confused. And I'll even see, to prove my point, because I've said this before on stream and I had some pushback for it, so... I love that even the Wikipedia article, when you read it, it goes, uh, Occam's razor, or the principle of parsimony, is the problem-solving principle that entities should not be multiplied beyond necessity. And then it continues, sometimes inaccurately inaccurately paraphrased as the simplest explanation is usually the best one. And that is like, everyone always goes, oh, like, Occam's razor, the simplest thing is is the most correct or the best thing. And it's like, no, what Occam's razor was is that entities should not be multiplied beyond necessity. And why that matters is because, think of it this way. You could have two theories. Uh, One that is so simple, like God created the universe, right? God just went, boop, created the universe. Very simple. The other could involve, like, uh, quantum mechanics and uh, I- inflationary models of the expansion of the cosmos, and, like all this stuff. Very complicated math, very hard to get into. One of these we have a ton of evidence for, you know? <laughs> the other uh, we have, I'll, I'll even give some credence and say we have some evidence in terms of people having religious experiences and whatnot. But it's like, you know, it may be the case that the physics explanation is the correct one. And it's more complicated. Just because one is simpler doesn't mean that it's better than the next. The reason why Occam proposed this idea of not multiplying entities beyond necessity, it's like, say, say you have a model that predicts something. So you have a theory and it gives you predictions about, uh, you know, let's say I drop rock, the rock falls, and it's going to cause water to ripple. Therefore, like I have a theory that if I drop this and I can make predictions, I drop this rock, the water's going to ripple. Okay. If I then propose that uh, what's happening there is not just the rock falling and causing the water to ripple, but like just as the rock is about to hit the water, fairies come out and go splash, 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 splash. (laughs) Does that really help my theory or was it sufficient just to say that if I drop the rock, if the water's gonna rip. I didn't need I definitely think it helps the theory. I think it's I think it's the better theory at that point. It might be the cooler sounding theory, but like I didn't need the fairies. They don't add anything, right? So like you don't need to multiply entities beyond necessity. That's the point of Occam's Razor. Stick to what we empirically know is essentially what he's getting at. 
And notice how he's appealing to Occam's razor to be like, I'm not going to pay attention to any of the empirical evidence. <laughs> I'm simply going to say that my theory is simpler. Because, like, what would account for uh, the all-cause fatality to remain consistent? It must be because there never was a pandemic to begin with. Therefore, uh, that's a way more simpler answer than saying there was a pandemic. Fucking incredible. This is like watching someone at LSD explain their visions. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Did the fairies cast a cloaking spell? Uh, on themselves? Yeah, that's why you can't see them. Checkmate. But I think he's going to explain why his theory is more... Uh... <laughs> Thanks, Nick, for, for clipping it. I should go to watch that right now. Let's do it. Fairies come out and go splish, splish, splash, splish, 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 splash. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Well done. But now let's hear from him why his, his theory is simple. So the simpler theory in this case is there simply wasn't a pandemic because the other theory is much more complex. We did all these things and we ended up with exactly the same result as if there was no pandemic, you see. So that... <laughs> Is, are you convinced, Elrod? Are you convinced? No. No, I'm really not, actually. <laughs> you, but you see what I mean about like the Occam's Razor thing? It's like, the more complex answer is yes, that the world is a messy thing with tons of variables. When you do one thing, such as like implementing uh, lockdowns and stay-at-home measures, you're going to decrease like uh, vehicle uh, accidents, and therefore you're going to like lower casualties there. And therefore, the numbers are not going to be consistent across the board. So it might be the case that given the co complex messiness of life, that yes, all-cause mortality might actually remain around the norm that it, it was going to end up if there was no pandemic, all because of the things that we did. That is a possibility in the realm of possibilities. And you don't get to wave that away by going, it's way more simpler to just say that there was no pandemic. you do this that's not science perhaps the real pandemic was the friends we made along the way yeah isn't that kind of the point when a pandemic is over it's supposed to go back to normal well his argument is that like nothing there was no dent in all cause fatalities so it's not that it like returned to a norm his argument is that it just never changed and therefore he's like well like what are the odds what are the odds of it just like evening out that way now, I don't, I don't know how to check his math because I, I think he's just pulling shit out of his ass anyways. And he's also using data that I already showed was not reliable, so you could just go back to that anyways. But even if we were to say his numbers are correct, I don't know what like statistical modeling he's doing to suggest that like the numbers are within the norm such that this isn't a deviation from where you could expect it if there was no pandemic. But then the more relevant question is not... That's why like him focusing on all like all causes of death and not disambiguate disambiguating them is a really bad way of going about this data because it's like maybe it's the case that like we had way less flu deaths which is true that we had way less car fatalities which is true and yet we had a shit ton of covid fatalities maybe there's a relation like maybe like it will even itself out depending on how more or less these things rose and fall rose and fell Sorry. mixed up my tenses there but he just ignores all of that empirical evidence and he's just like look the all cause says that it's uh relevant or relatively the same therefore we can just conclude that there was no actual pandemic it was all it was all an illusion i guess in in fucking incredible it was all a dream yeah <laughs> That would be my first answer, but it's, I'm still I still haven't given a complete answer. I could go on like this as to why that's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. No. I could go on, but like, ask me another question because I'd rather not. You know. <laughs> I could keep making shit up, but you just asked me to. Yeah. yeah. Sure. I would say the Occam's Razor thing is actually written in his fucking paper, which is incredible. But anyway. Oh, that makes sense. And I guess um, my question is then, did you find a difference since Does COVID it make sense? Yeah. <laughs>
Does that make sense to you, Drea? Did you follow all that, really? Did you <laughs> listen to that and say, yeah, no, I'll, all this makes sense. I totally paid attention. I didn't just accept whatever fit my narrative. Is that what happened, Drea? Did it make sense? I don't, I don't mean to be mean to Drea here, but it, I do feel like when I first like, listened to this guy, I can see why people who uh, are rebel listeners would listen to this and think that it's a trustworthy source and accept what he says and just be like, oh, that kind of makes sense. Like, yeah, sure. Uh, you know. So it's like, I, I am sympathetic to a certain extent. I don't think, I think to any lay person, uh, some of this could go over their heads a bit. And they could go like, yeah. That being said, if you're going to interview someone, maybe you should fucking like read up on this stuff before you do that. Just saying. Hey, don't insult them like that. It might be vulnerable to you. <laughs> I love her IKEA furniture background a lot. Yeah. I like this weird uh, world map with a Bible quote on it, too. That's fun. I guess um, my question is then, did you find a difference since COVID deaths became a thing? Um, did you find that there were other types of deaths that decreased since you're right. finding, you know, kind of right. no difference? Right. Now, remember, we're looking at robust data. We're not. So I want to get back to his answer in a second, but notice like this is a good uh, question as well. Let me uh, just get the, the end of it. So I can... um, did you find that there were other types of deaths that decreased since you're right. finding, you know, kind of right. no difference? Right. Now... So notice Drea asked the same question that we were posing. So again, props to Drea here. The least I, the, the one thing I could say about Drea here uh, her lack of pushback to obvious, like, poor answers is, like, bad, bad form here, right? But she's initially, like, instigating with, like, really good questions, which is, like, the point that I've been raising constantly. What about other deaths? Have they decreased and, like, whatnot? Like, isn't that going to factor into your data? Uh, yeah, no, check the chat. Now remember, we're looking at robust data. We're not trusting anyone who assigns cause of death. We're just looking at just all cause mortality, okay? I see. And so that's, we're not, we're not going to try to resolve the cause of death, but we still see things, phenomena that are along the lines of what you're asking, okay? So the, the next level of observation of the data is the following one. As I said, in a pandemic, it should spread like crazy. Mm -hmm. You can't have Ontario and Quebec being different, being very different, okay? And what we found was that even though the total over year. So I was a bit distracted there, but I also know he didn't really answer the question, did he? <laughs> he... No, no, he didn't. <laughs> now we're talking about the differences between Quebec and Ontario, but that doesn't tell us whether or not more people died in car accidents or, uh, or not, or like any of the other details, right? She asked a really good question, and then it was like, let's talk about this instead. <laughs> Can't imagine why he do that. Can't imagine. Here is the same. The spread in when it occurs in the year was very different. <laughs> and that never happens, okay? When you don't interfere with the phenomenon to the degree that we did this time with lockdowns and everything, these patterns are the same everywhere. You can go from the UK to Canada, from Quebec to Ontario, and we show these patterns in our article. The, the, the seasonal patterns in all-cause mortality are always the same. But now all of a sudden we hit this COVID era when we're doing all these dramatic, uh, we're applying all these measures to society. And what we find, the first thing we find as a huge anomaly is that right after the pandemic was announced, we get a very sharp peak in increased deaths. Right after March 11, 2020, all of a sudden in certain hotspots around the world, like New York and so on, in Quebec in particular, in Canada, we get a sharp rise in deaths and then it, and then it falls very quickly down within a month and a half or two. So think about what he's saying here. We just got an argument from him based on the t statistical all-cause data that there has been no increased death. It did, not, did he not just say that there was a spike in increased deaths at the beginning of the pandemic? He might, he might have said something like that, yeah. He might, he might have said that. <laughs> and... Again, it would be one thing if he wants to, like, take that and, and unfold with it by saying, like, 
but here's how it's compensated by other forces such that these deaths uh, worked out over here or whatever. But that goes against his, his main argument to, to argue that because he's just working. He's not, he doesn't care about the cause. Yet all of a sudden he's saying there's a spike. Not like, it's amazing. He could contradict himself. He's going to explain it, Jody. I'm sure of it. Okay, let's let's figure it out. I'm going to speed that. This part uh, drags a little bit here, so let's speed it up just a little bit. Okay, that we call the COVID anomaly. We gave it that name just to call it something. <laughs> um, but it, we argue that that. <laughs> I just so want to point that out one second. Down low. Whoa, Mizumi. Oh, Muta gifted. Thank you, Muta, for gifting a sub. You are incredible. Thank you, Muta. But it, we argue that that sudden rise is because of um, following the directives of the World Health Organization, which was to um, basically lock in elderly people into care homes. That's the worst thing you can do. Mm -hmm. So they shift, they, they, they transferred uh, sick people from hospitals into care homes, then locked them in. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the opposite of what we know you should do with epidemics to avoid epidemics in care homes. Mm -hmm. But what you should do is detect symptomatic disease and take those people out of the care home and treat them. If you leave them there and it can spread, you, you can kill a lot of people in the care homes. So despite the known science of how to avoid a pandemic. Like, he's basically saying like, they here it was a pandemic. This thing is spreading. They should have treated them differently than how he thinks they should have treated them. And like, maybe he's right here. Maybe he's not. I don't really care. The no, no, we're not, no, 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 we're not doing that. We're not going to let fucking discredited physicists play medical doctor <laughs> as if he knows what we should be doing with fucking treating people. We're not, we're not playing that game. I love, like, he tried to say that it, like, wasn't a pandemic, but he's like, we're going to call it, like, he, what did he say? It was something like the COVID factor or something? It was almost like he's not going to refer to it as, like, COVID-19, because it's not COVID-19. Remember, people die of, like, all the core morbidities. It has absolutely nothing to do with COVID. So it's like, That's right. he doesn't want to call it COVID. He's going to call it, like, it's just, or, or it's the response to COVID that he's going to, like, name it, because it's the response to COVID. It's what they did to tr what they thought were helping people. That that was what like killed them. It wasn't COVID. It was at the, the disease formerly known as COVID. Yeah. These epidemics in care homes. They did the opposite and they infected the care homes. And as a result, there was this huge burst of deaths in care homes, which we see in the all-cause mortality. And that burst of deaths was much larger in Quebec than any other province. See, that's the other thing that's not pandemic-like. In mm -hmm. a pandemic, you don't have features that are dramatically different from one jurisdiction to the other. Mm -hmm. The virus yeah. doesn't stop at a provincial border. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but what what does change at a provincial border, bud? <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, the virus, sure, the virus doesn't know whether or not it's in Quebec or Ontario. But there, there, there's these things, they're called governments, and they make policy decisions. And those differ based on the border and might, might uh, change the way these uh, viruses infect their populations. Do you imagine, though, if the disease did know, like you were Quebecois or something, <laughs> specifically avoided you for that reason? Like, eh, no, I do not want. <laughs> Je ne mange pas. <laughs> I think I just said, I do not eat. <laughs> uh, he said it's an epidemic and not a pandemic. That's right. That is right. Yeah, um, that so sense. that's the thing. So so combining this these these this um, heterogeneity of behavior <laughs> from province to province or region to region. You would go to Quebec or you wouldn't go to Quebec. Because the joke fails when your punctuation fails. <laughs> Jody doesn't eat. He only drinks Diet Pepsi. You know what? Correct. I, I exist, I subsist on sunlight and Diet Pepsi. And the fact that overall, though, the deaths total aren't changing. Those are two features that are contrary to the concept of a pandemic. And you asked me, well, were there, were there less deaths? Well, we in proved, I think, areas. in other areas and other causes of deaths. But I'll answer something related to that, which is the following. <laughs> He's still not going to answer the question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer something related to that. But I'm not going to answer your very devastating question to my whole fucking world. We proved for the first time that following that very sharp peak of deaths of the elderly that was induced by the measures, okay, following that, when you come down to the summer trough, you go lower 
than the trend of all the summer troughs for the last decade. First time we've ever seen that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you get, you induce all these deaths, you accelerate the deaths of all these elderly people, then you've killed them off to the point that in the, in the following summer, there's less deaths wow. than you would normally have. So that's- Well, some would say that's because of the vaccine's been rolled out to those No, no, this is, this is way before the vaccine's rolled out. This is the summer immediately following uh, oh, this, I see. that rise in, in 2020. Summer 2020. Yeah, summer okay. 2020. So you get this 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 downshoot. And we show the graph in our paper, and that's that that's known as the uh, dry tinder effect. It, it's been the dry about, tinder like, effect. If a season is really harsh on people and you kill them off, then there's less people. To that's right. Once you kill off all the old people, they become dry tinder. <laughs> or is it like the reverse? Like uh, like they were dry tinder and they all burned up, and now there's not enough dry tinder left. I don't know. I don't think we call them that, though. That's the thing. Yeah, is I, I don't think we call it that. I think this is. Uh, I think that's a lot. <laughs> I'm gonna go. I'm seeing my grandma this weekend. I'm gonna refer to her as Tinder. That's what she I is. I don't know if you should call <laughs> Gram 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 dry Tinder. <laughs> no, she's not the dry Tinder because she's alive, right? I don't know if I'm correcting the yeah, analogy just, to just... make it make more sense, or if he actually thinks the ones that are alive are the dry Tinder. I don't know. I just, I know a lot of epidemiologists. I don't typically hear them talk about human beings this way. I don't, I don't well, think it's something that happens as often as, uh, as he's, as he's saying. I have heard epidemiologists refer to the virus, like burning out or like running through like, uh, hosts and no longer sure, finding sure, sure. Like a place, right? Like the, those sure. kinds of phenomena exist, right? The thing that, like, his, the way he's describing this, like, doesn't connect is that, like, sure, this has affected uh, the older populations a lot. But, like, as the variants have mutated, like, Delta started hitting the younger people as well. And so it's like, uh, <laughs> you know, it's not just, like, the elderly population. And uh, there's still plenty of uh, elderly people dying, so it's not like it the, the virus has burned through every single old person, such that there's no no more old people available to get infected or some shit. The die later, but mm -hmm. I think our demonstration is right away on a month to month basis. We demonstrated the phenomenon and uh, clearly associated with that peak where they kill people in, in care homes. God so, damn, you know? um, so we see those kinds of phenomena that, that, that tell us that this, this is, this is not a viral phenomenon, that the virus doesn't decide all of a sudden to accelerate deaths so that it doesn't have to kill as many people uh, a little later on and, and to do that in one province, but not in another province. Okay. Let's talk about the young males. Uh, you said that it's elderly people and young males. How so? Right. Well, again, like why would it do it in one province and not another? Maybe two places. It doesn't like it doesn't like the French. Clearly, <laughs> I think that's what it really comes down to. I think this virus agrees with you know the general population of you know <laughs> gotta get rid of the French. Yes. Well, sorry, my Quebec friends, but uh, nature has spoken. Well, so I just talked about that peak, that very anomalous peak that was induced by the, those those horrid measures that they applied, which were counter science. Um, so I love that all, all the things they did at the beginning of the pandemic to keep people alive when we didn't have vaccines or didn't have a treatment regimen for it. Uh, we should have just, rather than putting them on ventilators to try to save what left we could, we should have just let them die on their own phlegm. And it was the putting them on the ventilators that killed them, not the fact that they were uh, dying of a, of a pandemic. And we should listen to this uh, crusty old. Have we already pointed out that he was fired from his university? <laughs> we will get to that in short measure. But like, yeah, this is this is the guy we have to trust on this. That was that definitely affected the elderly more than anyone else, and mm -hmm. it was the elderly in care homes. But if you follow now, if you look at the the data following that, in the in the following summer, if you look at the data, that same data by age group now, young men are way above what they have been for the last decade. Only young men, so mm. zero to 44 years old males, are died more in the summer that followed. And it comes out clearly in the data. Oh. Okay. And, and that those extra deaths of young men continued into the fall and into the winter, the following winter of young men. Now, and it happened mostly in Alberta and is undetected in Quebec. Mm. Again, a virus can't affect mm. Alberta and not Quebec. This was not a virus because it was happening in the summer when there's virtually no transmission of these viral diseases because there no, there's no stability whatsoever of, of aerosol particles. So it's happening in the summer. It's only affecting young men. Uh, these viruses don't affect men more than women, except in elderly because, because co-conditions are different. But in terms of, uh, for young people, it doesn't. So this is- I love like he's mixing his metaphors, right? Because his idea is like the, the virus doesn't do things differently in different places. 
But then he's like giving reasons for why it's doing things different in like other places. But of course, now he's moved away from like all the shit that he's previously said, and now he's going to try to find some way to describe why is it happening different in other places when he already argued that it shouldn't be. And then his reason is like, you could just find evidence for why. And there's probably some good evidence that, that has a little to do with what he's about to say. here. But uh, his, his explanation of the difference between Alberta and Quebec and why Alberta is seeing what more younger men dying of this than in Quebec is incredible. So here we go. It's not a viral phenomenon. This is, this is something other related to the measures that were applied and the, the impact on the economy that is such that young men lost their lives uh, predominantly. And it's interesting that it's mainly and most visible in Alberta and not in Quebec, for example, just to compare those two provinces, okay? So there's a lot going on there. Yeah. And um, if you ask me to interpret that, I would say that in Alberta, the psychological and social impact of the loss of employment and restructuring the economy and the lockdowns was greater on young men than in Quebec. And if I had to guess why that is, well, I mean, obviously there must be some important cultural differences there, but I would, I would tentatively say that in Alberta, there's much more uh, pride and kind of a conservative mentality that you work, at, you know, a fair day's work and that that is a large part of your personal identity. Whereas in Quebec, it's a more socialized uh, environment and, and people are more relaxed about that and have a, have a different attitude towards uh, their personal identity. Because we know sci scientists have established that uh, personal identity and how you see yourself um, compared to where you think you should be is a huge stressor. Mm -hmm. And scientists have shown that stress is the number one factor that affects whether or not you're going to be infected, how sick you're going to be for any disease and also for viral respiratory diseases. See, this is something the media will never- So, this, so see, there you go. So Albertans, they lost their job due to the pandemic. And because of that, they had an increased level of stress and died at faster rates than Quebec people. Because people in Quebec are like, I lost my job, hey! <laughs> Good riddance. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I didn't know we were going to be on the same side here, Pierre. Oh, apparently, Quebec people, they, they're like, we don't need to work. We're never going to work. Why work? We just want to sit at home and drink wine and eat cheese. Those Albertans, though, they, they, all they care about is work. And if they're not working, then they'll die of a pandemic. <laughs> and, like, again, not only is this reason, like, really stupid, and based on absolutely no evidence, he's just speculating on what he thinks the cause is here. He was arguing before that a virus shouldn't affect one population, or, like, the things you do to prevent, like, COVID, like wearing a mask, getting vaccinated, all that stuff, should have absolutely no effect on why these numbers difference from, uh, are, differ from place to place, right? That should have absolutely no effect, which is why he looked at the all-cause data. He's not going to get into that, any of that stuff. Yet, he found a discrepancy in the data for, like, why certain deaths were in Alberta and why other deaths were, had peaks in Quebec. And he's offering up these weird explanations that are not based on any evidence. Hey, child of mine, leave the cat alone. Sorry, my son was harassing the cat. What do you mean, what do I mean? You were shoving, like, food in her face. Go to bed! <laughs> I turn around and my son's, like, sticking food in my cat's face. I don't even know where you I think he's eating a banana. And the speculation is based on nothing. I was thinking he's purely grifting, but now I think he's an idiot who actually believes this. Uh... You know what? You might be onto something, and we will get to it. We will, I promise there will be, we will get into his history, which, uh, again, I did not exhaustively research it, but it is fascinating. I never tell you is that the science, there's hard science that shows that in terms of being infected by a viral respiratory disease, the predominant factor after age, because obviously age is what makes you most fragile, but it, the, the other big determining factor is the psychological stress that you're subjected to or that you experience in your life. Uh, on this note, too, I just want to point out, because he, he, he needs to have this weird explanation about the psychology of needing to work uh, for Albertans in Quebec. And that's how he explains this like discrepancy. But like, what about Ontario? Like if Ontario didn't get hit in this age bracket, are like we on par with Quebec or are we like more neutral in that a few more of us died? Because like, why is he only focusing on Alberta and Quebec here? It's very strange to me. 
And the second most important factor is the degree to which you're socially isolated. Right. So people who have less social connect connectivity die more from viral respiratory diseases. And these are not small effects. This is a, this is, these are the major determinants, which you never hear about. So here we are, we're isolating elderly people, the most fragile, isolating them completely in care homes, locking them into a closed environment like, where, like viral, how convenient. where viral respiratory Everything uh, that we uh, did viruses in aerosol to stop this pandemic are was really the thing that them out when they get sick. Uh, and, and isolating them and stressing them with, you know, how we, we're interacting with them, wearing masks and gloves and things. It's the worst thing you could do. So these were, these, the care homes in Canada, especially in Quebec. And I can honestly say this with my grandparents too. Like he put it out there, like part of the stress for like older people was not just that they were like in these long-term care homes and like isolated, but was the fact that you visited them wearing masks. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like every time I visited my uh, uh, grandparents and they were wearing masks, it was uh, I didn't sense a, an additional element of stress on their part due to the mask. I think uh, other things might have been stressful. In Ontario, were death camps yeah. during this period. Well, we've seen some evidence of that, uh, you know, after the fact as well. Yeah. And it shows clearly in the all-cause mortality. That's our point. You can actually see the signature of that in all-cause mortality. So right now we're being told that uh, there's a fourth wave. I'm in the province of BC. You did look at uh, all of the provinces and, you know, we're told that, you know, ICUs are filling up, especially with unvaccinated people. What can you tell us from your statistical analysis on the difference of death rates pre-vaccine and now a summer with the vaccine rolled out? Um, okay. Are you noticing anything there? Overall for, uh, overall for Canada, nothing. The seasonal surge, winter surge, the seasonal hump in all-cause mortality uh, for, for the winter, you know, that includes January 2021, that mm -hmm. peak is no bigger integrated seasonally than it has been for the last decade. There's nothing visible in Canada. However, it is larger in some provinces and smaller in others, okay? There's that heterogeneity, which is uncharacteristic of anything we've ever seen before. And that's because measures have different effects province to province, but the virus is okay, the same. I think I'm the viruses, the because there are always many viruses, are the same. There's just a bunch of nonsense. I want to get to the end. Uh, uh, and uh, also incredible. disciplining professionals for not being professional, for following protocols. One, one, re, one one bacterial lung infections, they died, and so on. There's, they're allowing you to work, uh, the impact they had on jobs. response was using, oh, if you want to, should be right. disciplining questions. Oh, okay, here, so we're going to get to the no final question. The reason well, I skipped I ahead here is he just rambles on. I think we've hit most of the points, right? Uh, but he ends on a high note, something very incredible. So I did want to catch the end of it. The guy's like Voldemort, never says his name. <laughs> uh, so, I don't know. I'll just play it. I, I can't set this up. This is just incredible. Uh, and Elron, if you're there, you're going to love this. Uh, uh, I'm here. I'm ready. Yeah, okay. Here we go. I'm going to I'm gonna bring it back down to normal so we can uh, get the full effect of it. Uh, and Simone. What? Huh? Yeah, we hear you. Everyone hears you. The world hears you. Can't argue with you there, and also it seems like we might be coming into another season of insanity where the same methods are going to be repeated. But I hope not. In closing, I know you said you've worked on a lot of peer-reviewed uh, research. What are the chances of this study that you've done being <laughs> peer-reviewed? I've, I've, I'm not even wasting my time on that anymore. I'm just uh, self-publishing and publishing with websites that want to reap. Publish. My first article on masks was read 400,000 times on ResearchGate, and then they took it down, they deplatformed me, and I talked to the CEOs, and I said, what's going on? And they said, oh, it was being read too much. It was having too much of an influence, and it's contrary to what the World Health Organization is saying. I said, but it's a review of the science. It's a rigorous review of the science. I'm just saying what's out there in terms of uh, serious studies. And they said, well, no, we, we're not having it. And so I was deplatformed from ResearchGate, which is one of my main, uh, my main places for this kind of uh, scientific publishing. Um, so I'm, I'm not even gonna waste my time arguing with referees and, and editors because they are so, they have this tunnel vision and um, they're not being honest and objective, no. So what do you think about Rancor? <laughs> yeah. Amazing. So, so just to, just so that I'm clear about this, uh, Dreas started this segment saying that legitimate scientists publish their work in peer-reviewed papers and not on YouTube. True. And this person, this individual, 
uh, publishes his shit on Rebel News videos and on his personal website. Yep. And explicitly says they're not going to go through peer review. Yep. Okay. All right, then. <laughs> and, uh... I love, I love too, he's like, they read it too much and it goes against the consensus, uh, and that's why they, like, took it down, right? And it's because, like, all the scientists out there, they're all just, like, they bought into all the shit, and therefore, yeah. like, they're not gonna listen to me who's just, like, spitting facts out here. I... I want to go to... I, we're not gonna read the mask paper, but there is a very fun uh, Ecology Today blog which uh, talks about his mask article. And uh, I want to I wanna read a portion of this uh, to describe what is actually in uh, the, the paper, you know. So this is, the person is talking about a colleague of his who said they were sent the mask article by, uh, by Rancourt. So that's, that's, a, the lead in and then we'll get what some of it is so because when my colleague asked for scientific evidence to back this denial the poster directed her to an article by dennis rancourt entitled masks don't work and indeed rancourt's paper cited eight peer-reviewed essays all from reputable journals but when she actually clicked clicked on the links provided she found something very curious none of the studies cited concluded what rancourt says they did for example Six of the eight studies measured the effectiveness of N95 respirators compared to surgical masks, not, as Rancourt implied, the effectiveness of wearing a mask versus not wearing a mask. Further, the quotes he provided from these articles misrepresented their findings. For example, his quote from a 2012 study in the journal Influenza and Other Respiratory Viruses read, and this is the quote, None of these studies established a conclusive relationship between mask respirator, respirator use and protection against influenza infection. But that's the end of the quote. This implies that there's no benefit to wearing a mask. In reality, however, the slash in the mask slash respirator phrase is meant to indicate a comparison between the two types of facial coverings. In other words, the study is saying that masks and respirators are equally effective. It is not lumping them together and declaring them both ineffective. Several of the sentences before and after the ones uh, quoted demonstrates. So this is uh, back to the text. Eight of, the, uh, eight of nine respective, retrospective observational studies found that mask and or respirator use was independently associated with a reduced risk of severe acute respiratory syndrome. So you get the gist. He basically uh, cited a bunch of stuff and then uh, misquoted it to try to argue that masks don't work when almost everything that he cited concluded that masks actually do work and contradicted nice. what he said. So, uh, so that's, that's, uh, that's him. Now, why, why was he fired, okay? <laughs> why was he fired? That's, that is the burning question on my mind. Like to know. So we get this old McLean's article from 2009 with the wonderful title. In this class, everyone gets an A. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, oh, dear. <laughs> so the, the long sorted history is kind of complicated. Before we get into like the A stuff, I, I first want to highlight that he... What was it? Let me uh, let me just pull this up. Make sure that I get it correct before I say something that's either uh, not true or or whatever. I think the first thing he did was in two thousand and five. The first thing he did that pissed off his employer, and he did what's called academic squatting, which is a term I've never heard before. But it's basically when a tenured professor decides to change the course material that they're teaching without like informing uh their their department mm. so he was supposed to be teaching a course on physics and decided he wanted to talk about uh science so it says uh on how science impacts everyday life 
and how it relates to greater power structures. That's okay. That's what uh, it says on the wiki. I can't find too much information uh, as to what exactly he spoke on. I found stuff from him, and mostly he concludes that he was talking about things like uh, Palestinian rights. Now, I'm someone who's pro-Palestinian rights. I'm not sure how that fit into a physics course. <laughs> or even a course on, like, like, science and power or whatever he was saying. I'm not sure how it fully fits. But he decided he was just going to teach this instead of teaching his actual course. Okay? Then... After being, so he, he was not fired for that, although they removed his, uh, uh, his ability to teach. They told him he wasn't going to teach anymore. Well, no, that's not the case. Well, I think part of it was, like, they, he got to remain a teacher, even though uh, they were upset with him. He also started a blog around this time as well that was called U of O Watch Blog. So he was at the University of Ottawa. He started a blog criticizing the university, which caused a whole bunch of problems. Then in 2008, and we'll get, some of, we'll get to some of those blog problems in a second, but then in 2008, he decided that he was no longer going to grade his students. He was going to give everyone who took his class an A+. Now, this is a complicated thing because there is some research about grading and how effective, non-effective it is, and whether you should go to a pass-fail model or any of that, okay? Those are interesting pedagogical discussions that uh, are cool and worth having. But what he decided to do was contrary to what he was told he has to do, which is give grades, he just started giving his students A+. Pluses. And so they were like, that's not your job. You're supposed to give a grade. <laughs> Based on like the criteria that we provide. And he was like, Nah, I'm going to give them all A+. Pluses. And because of that, they fired him. They actually went through the process of removing him. And there was a long, protracted uh, union fight, because obviously, well, uh, it's not quite a union, but the Canadian Association of uh, University Teachers, CAUT, they uh, defended him. And I think oh. eventually, eventually they actually agreed with the employer at the end. Uh, after a long protracted battle, and was like, the university was justified in firing. And uh, so he no longer works there. <laughs> a big chance. Now, Jesus Christ. It's not really a grade if they're all at the same level. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. The other thing, uh, laugh my ass if I went to you of Ottawa. So did you meet this uh, person then, Bonrado? Did you take any physics? That'd be incre incredible. Gotta have gradients. So here's here's the other weird thing. It seems this gets tricky, and it gets tricky because he's going to say some things that I agree with here, and I can't. I haven't done enough digging to know where he lands on this, but he was claiming that he was fired. the The reason why they latched onto this issue to fire him was because the university was being pushed by, like, uh, the Zionist lobby because of his outspoken views about Palestine. Oh. Now, I, I don't know that that's the case, and I was reading some of his blog posts, and there's definite, so, like, if you read this article, it says this is what brought me on to the Zionist stuff, because... It goes here, at first glance, uh, Denis Rancourt is a self-proclaimed anarchist with a history of causing trouble. Over the past five years, the University of Ottawa professor has unsuccessfully sued his employer for millions of dollars over a cancelled course, claimed that the school's president is part of a continental Zionist conspiracy, taught a controversial activism course, and denied the existence of climate change. Okay? The climate change thing is 100% real. He denies the existence of climate change. Okay? So we'll just put that out there. He's a, he was already a climate denier, okay? But what caught my eye was this uh, claims that the president is part of a continental Zionist conspiracy, okay? Now, when I was reading a lot of his blog posts, I was thinking, is this, is, is what he's saying really like a conspiracy or was he leveling like legitimate critiques against 
Zionism, which I think is justified. And when I was looking into it, most of it came across as like legitimate critiques. Most of it. Now, here's the thing is, I didn't read it all. So if like things are out there and exist, 100%. Where it started to get really weird for me, the thing that was like closest to Zog stuff or really icky stuff was he was saying that like he was veering really close to Jews controlling the media territory. Okay? And so some of that might have been uh, in there somewhere. And if that's the case, very icky. The other thing that's really icky is I was finding that uh, he no longer has his blog available. I couldn't find any of the original posts, but the only people quoting his blog that exist out in the internet landscape were mostly neo-Nazis, uh, which a little uh, a little concerning. So that's why I'm like, I'm hedging here. I don't want to condemn him for like actually criticizing the state of Israel and the stuff that they do. I think that's a legitimate thing and he should be able to do. And we do have evidence of uh, universities clamping down on Palestinian activism on campus. All of that is true. But I'm willing to concede, given everything else that we know about this guy, that it probably is, is he's way on the fringe and probably veers into, uh, uh, yeah, Zog stuff. In fact, uh, a bunch of his papers on ResearchGate uh, talk a lot about, in quotes, globalists and he even puts it in quotes so oh my gosh <laughs> that's incredible honestly <laughs> globalists have come to research gate which sounds uh, me so yes very concerning uh since since being kicked out of uh the university of ottawa it also turned out that like he wrote a blog post where uh I mean, I'll zoom in on this. I'm not going to read it out loud. Uh, but uh, said some pretty racist stuff about a, a colleague of his. And from what I understand, so, uh, you know, I'll highlight the comments. You can, you can have fun reading that if you want. But what I gather from what happened was that this professor, uh, Joanne St. Louis, or if, I think they are a professor, but they were also like a part of like a board. And the person on the board they were dealing with whether or not uh, there was racism in dealing with cases of fraud, uh, systemic racism in cases of fraud. So the idea is uh, how heavy handed the university dealt with people uh, in fraud cases dependent on the race. Right. And there was a report that suggested that the University of Ottawa was way more heavy handed towards uh, racial minorities. Okay. Now, Joanne St. Louis actually said that she found errors in the report that showed that there was this systemic bias, but then offered that we should continue doing research into the subject at the university to make sure that, that we can alleviate any racial bias that might exist. And because she stated what I just said, that's why uh, he, this dude, called her that. Which I have to say... What she said was probably reasonable. Even like even even if you're like more like radical and you think the report was legitimate and she ra raised critiques and so you're mad at the fact that she raised those critiques, she still was like, let's actually investigate this. Which is what the like conclusion of the activist was anyways, right? Oh man, you Ottawa literally had like 20 profs sign a petition to be able to say the N-word in class. <laughs> oh my god. Alright. Oh, guy knows what it's like to be able to have a job and the stress for that. <laughs> so wonderful this guy is such a wonderful history. And it continues. So he ended up starting something called the Ontario uh Civil Liberties Association, the OCLA. So he started this thing. And one of the first things they did was defended Kevin Johnson, the uh, mayoral candidate, COVID denier of uh, Calgary. He defended him uh, and said that his rights were being taken away after Johnson uh, said some uh, hate-motivated things, racially hated-motivated things. And 
I think recently recently he was convicted of it. Like he was charged with it. He was found guilty of the things that uh Rancourt was defending him for back in 2017. So, so this guy is special. <laughs> That's pretty much all I got. That was the extent of my research. And I was just like, I could keep going. This guy has a whole fucking wacky history. But the message I want to leave you with in doing this story is just like, Rebel was just like, you know what? Let's platform that guy. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's hear what he has to say about a global pandemic. The guy who got fired for giving his students all grade A pluses. The guy who was sued for uh, using racially loaded language to fellow professors the guy who uh started a blog uh that spouted uh possibly very likely anti-semitic conspiracy theories who started a civil liberties organization that protects racists or defends them at least he's the one that we have to trust when he writes something for his research gate blog on, on what, what is happening with COVID. I also want to say, YouTube, I mean, YouTube doesn't publish the whole clip. The reason why we watched it on Rumble is because they realize they can't post this entire thing on YouTube because YouTube has a ban. And recently, YouTube's been flagging a lot of my content, criticizing these people. And the irony is, uh, at least for the one clip that we did recently, which had to do with the University of Western Ontario professor who was a COVID uh, denialist who refused to get vaccinated. She, that video was on full on YouTube, on Rebel News. In fact, it's probably still there. I can probably search for it. And yet YouTube allows them to post this shit and infect the brains of thousands of people. What? Yet goes after people like me and flags our videos because we we cover it so i hope uh yeah look at that the video is still up yeah my video is down crit criticizing it but their video in full is up it's julie uh, panessi i don't want to listen to it so uh they use bots to report you i mean probably it's uh pretty shitty though and youtube needs to step its game up for sure but my point is, this this they platform this shit to their viewers. All these denialists and get to post a lot of it on YouTube. I mean, the Rumble thing. There's not much we can do about that. Rumble is fucking Peter Thiel, and they're gonna they're gonna keep doing what they do, you know. But uh, this this the state we're in now. That's all I gotta say on this. Hello, my rebels. Hello, my rebels. I'm a good boy. I'm a weirdo.